Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. Thanks so much for joining me here on the program. And I've got a great conversation for you with Robert De La Hunty, who is the author of the brand new book, Out Today, June 27th, uh, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Supreme Court. About a third of the way th- uh, through it, and I'm really enjoying it. I, you know, when is the last time you learned about Marbury versus Madison or Maryland versus McCullough? Like things that there's so many, so much things about, uh, so many things about doing this show that I love, like learning about, let me say, relearning about things that I was taught in high school that I didn't care about then and then find fascinating now because I'm an adult. Uh, and walking through some of the Supreme Court decisions and the evolution of the court was a really fun read. And so I invited Robert De La Hunty, who is a fellow at the Claremont Institute Center for the American Way of Life in Washington, D.C., former uh, U.S. Department of Justice and Deputy General Counsel in the White House Office of Homeland Security, legit credentials. He wrote this book with John Yu, who is out at the Hudson Institute, uh, and it's a great read. And so we're going to talk today about some of those decisions about judicial review and about Dobbs. We're a year on from the Dobbs decision, and we'll talk about that and Roe v. Wade and uh, the Roberts Court. And we'll also get into the accusations against Justices Alito and Thomas and appearances of impropriety and get his opinion on it. So great conversation. You can find the book in the show notes. I also want to thank all of our Patreon uh, subscribers. Thank you so much for supporting the show. And I especially want to thank our $100 a month uh, members, Vincent Peichel, Lars Nordskog, Jake Edel, Matthew Durbin, Reinhold, Christy Avery, and Jason Doolittle. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate all the kind words on the birth of my uh, son and the last episode. I really do appreciate that. If you didn't listen, make sure you go back and check that out. Deeply personal conversation. And uh, looking forward to uh, giving you an update. He's doing great. My wife is doing great. And we're a happy family of four now. So now let's get on to the show. And right after these messages will be our conversation with Robert De La Hunty about the Supreme Court. Robert De La Hunty, thanks so much for joining me, author of the brand new book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Supreme Court, along with your co-author, John Yu, who is a professor of law at UC Berkeley. Uh, now, you're a fellow at the Claremont Institute for the American yes, Way of Life. Yes. And uh, let's start with a little bit about your background. You actually have yeah. a really interesting background. Not only Thank do you, you work at the Claremont Institute, but you've worked in the government in various positions, like for the Department of Justice. Yes, I was in the Department of Justice and other federal agencies for about 18 years, from 1986 to 2004. Most of that time I spent in the Office of Legal Counsel, where I wound up in the senior executive service. And I worked for John Yu when he was there. Um, and uh, that's how we became very good friends. Uh, before that, I had some time on Wall Street in a big law firm there. And then before that, I went to law school. And before that, I studied and taught in um, the UK at Oxford and Durham universities for about 12 years. Hey, I can hear a little bit of the lilt from Oxford. Uh, are are yeah. you were you born in England or did, did no, you? No, 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 no. I'm a New Yorker. Okay, all right. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, you know, I never know what to expect. I think the uh, some of our audience may be familiar with the politically incorrect guides. I have several of them. Uh, it's a really always an interesting read because you get information that you might not see elsewhere. So I wasn't sure when I picked it up if it would be like a history of the Supreme Court or um, you know, if it was more of a current critique and there's a little bit of everything in it. So what was your strategy in writing the politically incorrect guide to the Supreme Court? Well, we wanted to write a book. We started on it about a year ago. Uh, we wanted to write a book that was at once sophisticated and accessible. Uh, both of us are legal scholars and law professors, though I'm retired. And um, we also practice constitutional law, uh, but we wanted, we aimed at an audience um, that was not necessarily lawyers at all, but people with an interest in the workings of the Supreme Court and in particular uh, in the decision-making by the Supreme Court since the three uh, Trump appointees took their seats on it. So if you are 
let's say, a parent who is homeschooling a child or a law student or your retired person like me who wants to know more about how the government works, uh, the book is aimed at you. Uh, I think the key thought was misinformed and unfair. Uh, people were attacking the court essentially on policy grounds or political grounds. But in fact, what we think the court was doing uh, was trying to not make policy decisions, but assign responsibility for making policy, whatever it turned out to be, to the right decision maker. It's a kind of second order um, question that the court often deals with in constitutional law. So, for example, uh, in the abortion case, the court was not ruling on the wisdom or unwisdom of abortion. Um, it was ruling on the question who makes these decisions. Is it the federal judiciary and ultimately the Supreme Court, or is it the voters in the states? Uh, which lane does that question belong to? And it concluded correctly um, that that decision is for the voters in the states. Give you another example from this term. There was an interesting case out of California involving pork. Uh, the voters in California are very conscious of animal welfare and they are opposed to cruelty to animals when they're bred or reared. So they enacted a law that prohibited the sale in California of pork uh, that was reared in conditions that the voters found cruel and unkind. The pork producers in the rest of the country, California is a very big market, brought suit under the federal constitutional commerce clause, and they alleged that California's animal welfare law was uh, a breach of the requirements of the commerce clause. The Supreme Court ruled against them. Now, that's not to say the Supreme Court had a view about animal welfare or about the sale of pork in California grocery stores um, whether uh, the pork should be raised in a particular way or not. It was saying this lane belongs to the voters of California, not to the federal judges. The Constitution doesn't regulate this. It allows the California voters to decide, even if prices go up, it allows them to decide we will not permit the sale of certain kinds of pork. Or I'll give you a third example. Uh, we don't have a result yet. Uh, this is the student loan forgiveness case. Uh, if the court does decide that on the merits this week, it's not going to be deciding whether Biden's student loan forgiveness program is a good idea or a bad idea. If it decides against Biden, which I think it would, it will say this is not a decision committed to the president by the Constitution or to executive agencies. This is a decision that requires Congress to debate and compromise and in the end decide what national policy is going to be about the forgiveness of $400 billion or so worth of student loans. It's not opposing student loans. It's not a hard-hearted conservative majority that wants to do down student debtors. It's saying this is a decision for another branch of the government, the Congress, and not either for us or for the president and the executive. Part of our message, a large part of our message, is that this is good for the court to decide not issues of policy, but legal issues about who the correct decision maker is. Sometimes it is the court, but often it isn't. And often the court has aggrandized power for itself that really belongs in other parts of the government or with the voters. Yeah, I think one thing about the book that I've enjoyed so far, I mean, Look, it's been 30, 35 years since I've studied Marbury versus Madison. I, it's not something I run across every day in my uh, everyday life, even even though I've been talking politics for a long time. Um, but the term originalism pops up a lot. Uh, you know, you start by defining originalism versus more of an activist mindset. And then you go on to lay out the case through three initial cases by Marshall, then through the Civil War era, then the Warren Court or FDR's period and then the Warren Court's. Uh, how the Supreme Court's mission got twisted away from the original meaning. So can we start by defining originalism versus the living constitution theory? Forget what the exact term was in the in the introductory chapter. No, but we wasn't. hear a lot about the term originalism, especially with this court. 
What does that mean? So um, it's basically a method for interpreting and applying the Constitution, and it's politically neutral. Um, sometimes if you are an originalist judge, you will get politically liberal results. Sometimes you'll get politically conservative results. But it's a method of reading the constitutional text. And what it does is to say the Constitution means what it meant when the relevant clauses were adopted by the people of the United States. It had a public meaning at that time, whether it was, let's say, 1787 or 1868 or more recently, it had a public meaning. It was debated and accepted or rejected with that understanding of what it meant. And there are procedures for changing the Constitution, uh, but if they haven't been followed, then the original meaning of the constitutional language stands in place. It stands firm. That is the law. If you do not like it, if you want to change it, you amend the Constitution, and that has happened. It happened actually very early on with the adoption of the Bill of Rights. So the understanding, the, the view is that the original public understanding at the time of the adoption of the Constitution or later amendments, that is what controls the court in trying to interpret the meaning of a constitutional clause or text. Now, I can just hear someone rolling their eyes saying, all right, but they had muskets and smallpox and they lived th 300 years ago. Why, why should we be held to their standards today? That just sounds outdated, Robert. Well, I think there are pretty simple answers to that. One is the decision making about how we are governed, how we live, is really largely left to the political elected branches of the government, to Congress, to the president, to the states. And the Constitution creates, mostly it creates structures and procedures. And if you follow those procedures, you can update the law as much as you please. Uh, and if uh, the Constitution as written in 1787 or after the Civil War, um, or more recently in the 20th century, if the Constitution stands in the way, you can amend it. It's difficult, but you can do that. But there's there are ways and means of updating the law, certainly by statute or by common law judicial decision making, or again by amending the Constitution. We're not what the Constitution really does is to provide an architecture, and you have a great deal of scope uh, within the framework that it creates. And by the way, we think it's a very good architecture. It's, it stood in place for over 200 years, mostly, and it has helped this country become as free and as prosperous as it is. Do we now, want to give that up? I don't. Um, no. I'm not an anarchist libertarian, but, um, no. you know, uh, Let's go back to Marbury versus Madison, because this is uh, I, I found it surprising kind of reading it as an adult. But it, it, your first couple chapters, I mean, we always think, oh, well, the court is just so political now. It's just so much more political. It used to just be men who are devoid of politics sitting on the court. Uh, but it always seems to have been political, according to these chapters. You know, when you get down to Marbury versus Madison, the choice, it's almost like Bill Clinton's what is the definition of is, how he was getting himself out of a legal trap by asking yeah. that question. Uh, you know, can you talk about Marbury versus Madison? Give us a little bit of the history and how that set the template for judicial review moving forward with the Supreme Court. No, that's a great question. Um, judicial review is key to the American constitutional system. And although other nations have adopted judicial review since then, uh, we really blazed the path. There were forms of judicial review even before the Constitution, before the U.S. Constitution. There were forms of it, the rather timid forms in Britain and in our states. But it really begins to take hold in our federal constitution of 1787. And the first case maybe not quite the first, but certainly the first big case, to affirm the power of judicial review is Marbury versus Madison. It's decided after Thomas Jefferson becomes the third president of the United States, and it's decided 
by one of his political foes. There were two parties at the time, the Republicans, later the Democrats, under Jefferson, and the Federalists, uh, one of whose members was the then Chief Justice John Marshall. Marshall was the third Chief Justice. The first two, uh, John Jay and Oliver Ellsworth, were distinguished in their own right, but um, not great Chief Justices, not notable in any particular way. But Marshall had a very long term uh, and was extremely influential in shaping the foundations of American law. He was appointed kind of at the last minute by John Adams, a Federalist president and George Washington's successor as president. He was appointed by Adams and he stayed on the court for decades after that. And the, the facts are um, basically these, that at the very last minute, as the Federalist president, John Adams, was about to leave office and before his political opponents, the Jeffersonians, took in, the Federalist Congress, the Federalist-controlled Congress, created a lot of new judicial jobs, judicial offices. And in order to occupy a judicial office, you have to be nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate, and then commissioned by the president. You get those of people in your audience who are military officers will know about this. They get a commission from the president saying that you so-and-so are commissioned officer of the United States as a colonel or whatever. And that has to be signed and sealed and delivered. And uh, at the last minute, one of the uh, new judges whom the Federalists had appointed um, was supposed to be commissioned, but didn't get it. And so at, it was midnight. He turned into a pumpkin. He did not have his commission to hold his judicial office. And he sued the Jefferson administration um, for the issuance of the commission that had been signed and sealed. And Jefferson clearly was of a mind not to give it to him. So we're set up here for a confrontation with the Supreme Court in which the Federalist judge or plaintiff who is seeking commission to be judge is suing Jefferson's administration for the release of the document that President John Adams had signed, which would be the commission entitling the plaintiff to hold and exercise the judicial offices. And John Marshall is in politically a weak position. Um, the opposition has really, it was the election of 1800 was a was truly a revolutionary election. The first time the White House had changed hands between parties. John Marshall wanted to avoid uh, a political confrontation which he might well lose. And he wanted to avoid issuing an order, a mandate to Jefferson to deliver the commission to Marbury which uh, Jefferson might well refuse to obey. So he did something really very brilliant. John, John Marshall, Chief Justice John Marshall did something very brilliant. He said, the court doesn't have jurisdiction to hear this case. There's an act of Congress that Marbury had cited that supposedly gave the Supreme Court the power to decide his case and order the issuance of his commission. And uh, Marshall said, that act of Congress isn't valid. It's not constitutionally valid. It doesn't square up with the judicial power as defined in Article 3 of the Constitution. So although Marbury is entitled to his commission, he can't get a court order for Jefferson to deliver it because we don't have jurisdiction to take action here. That's the start of judicial review, which is the power in the courts <clears throat> the federal courts, to invalidate or strike down acts of Congress uh, or later state acts that they find to be incompatible with the Constitution. And that is an enormous power. And it is what has given the Supreme Court so much influence in American life and why it has always inevitably been politically controversial. Because to take on an act of Congress that has been passed by both houses and usually, anyway, signed into law by the president and to take that law, which has uh, democratic validation behind it and to say, it's not a law at all, it's a nullity. It is inconsistent with the constitution. To say that is to say a lot. And sometimes the Supreme Court has erred very gravely in its decisions about what Congress can and cannot do. Yeah, you talk, um 
a little bit about Dred Scott and how the Supreme Court was basically trying to end slavery and then just ended up making it worse. You talk about FDR and the Supreme Court trying to and successfully striking down a lot of the New Deal until uh, court packing. And then they weirdly seem to go, well, all right, let's take it easy on the president before he does court pack us. Um, but let's let's hop to the Warren. We're, we're a year out from the Dobbs decision. I think it's a year yesterday or today. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, that we're recording that this uh, on June 27th. So I, I think a lot of people misunderstand what Roe v. Wade was because it's wrapped in the culture war conversation of rights and women's rights and and all these other things. But why do conservatives generally uh, and even some liberal scholars who were honest 20 years ago and now <laughs> have changed their mind? Why was Roe v. Wade so controversial at the time from the standpoint of its legal decision and what did Dobbs correct? Oh, again, a really great question. You're right that uh, Roe v. Wade, which came down in 1973, uh, was um, a salvo in the culture war. Um, some people think, I'm not sure they're right historically, but some people think that there was underway already a trend in the states or some of the states to relax the abortion laws, traditionally the abortion laws had made the procurement of an abortion or the commission of an abortion a crime. Uh, some people think that that was beginning to change. I'm not sure that that's true, but that's a widespread belief. Yeah, you had some states like New York starting to loosen up and, and discussions were underway at the time right. that, you know, with women's liberation and all that starting to form, you could, you could definitely see that argument. But there was some pushback going on even before Roe. In any case, I think the court decided, and there was a considerable majority in favor of Roe, seven to two, that they would jump to the head of the parade uh, and they would announce a new abortion right. And the problem that, again, I think it's important to distinguish legal and political conservatives. Often they're the same person like me, but that is a distinction to be kept in mind. Legal conservatives thought this is legislation. What the court is announcing is a legislative framework. It might be a model statute for a state like New York or Massachusetts, but there's nothing to support this in the Constitution. Not only does the Constitution not mention or allude to abortion in any way, the traditional practice at the time of Roe and understanding was that matters of sexual conduct, if they were going to be regulated at all, would be regulated ordinarily by the states and the states could structure their abortion laws in different ways. Um, and it was really a policy question, whether you uh, prohibit abortion or if you do, what stage in the pregnancy uh, is the cutoff point for um, uh, regulation of the woman's choice. So the legal, conservative legal objection to Roe right from the start was that it was foundationless. It was lawmaking, legislative uh, policy made by the justices. And cons legal conservatives have maintained that position, I would say, correctly, uh, until last year when Dobbs retreated on Roe, as an earlier Supreme Court decision from the 1990s had already done. It retreated from Roe and it said this question is to be left to the states or maybe to Congress if Congress has the power to pass a national abortion law, but it's not for nine justices on the Supreme Court bench. So this is why it's puzzled me. Quite honestly, it does puzzle me why there's so much resistance to the Dobbs decision, because it's not preempting anybody. If you believe that there should be a right to an abortion, go out and get that enacted into law in your state. I saw, uh, I read an account of a meeting that the vice, uh, the first lady, Jill Biden, recently had of various women who had tried to get abortions this past year and found that they couldn't and experienced a lot of difficulties. And they were telling their stories. And I, I read this and I thought, these are important things to know when you're making foreign policy, but don't attack the Supreme Court. Attack, go and ask your legislature. 
in Minnesota or in Oklahoma to deal with this. This is not a matter of constitutional law. Yeah, I think a big symptom of it is just the centralization or federalization of all politics. I mean, it's now we're now to the point where local politics have become like federal elections. Everything's the election of 1800 or 2016 again. Um, and so it's just easier to wave that magic wand and have it have it change there. So let's talk about the Roberts court. Uh, how is this court different? Obviously, you know, we're we're told if we watch the media that this is just the most conservative court of all time. And it's a, a Republican court. And uh, we'll talk about Alito and Thomas in the next question. But, you know, we're just we're given a picture, I think, of this court as somebody who follows it and understands it. Talk about the Roberts Court's makeup. How is it actually different? And, you know, what should we know about the justices that are serving right now and how it operates? Sure. Um, well, look, um, it's different from earlier courts in that more of the justices are really committed to originalism as a technique for interpreting the Constitution. Uh, and more of them, I think, are aware that there are limits to their power or their authority. Uh, and that um, they should be primarily concerned in most constitutional cases with deciding who the decision maker is rather than making the decision. They should get out of the business of making the laws or making the policies and confine themselves to uh, seeing that the right decision maker is present. Who are they? Well, uh, they come from different backgrounds. Many of them have been, several of them have been Washington DC insiders for much of their careers, Justice Thomas, uh, is an example. He had appointments in the first Bush administration, for example. John Roberts is another. He was, I used to see him wandering around uh, the hallways of the Department of Justice. I never thought he'd be Chief Justice. I might have tried to be friendlier if I had known that. Um, <laughs> but he was a Washington, D.C. lawyer in private practice and in the government. Uh, Justice Alito was the deputy head of my office for a while in the Department of Justice. Again, somebody whose career has mostly been in uh, in the government before, and then as a federal appellate judge before going to the Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Barrett is interesting because she was a law professor at Notre Dame. Um, she is one of the, uh, maybe she's the only uh, justice, but she's one of the few anyway, who does not have an Ivy League legal background, which I think is very good. Justice Jackson, who is the uh, latest appointment by Biden, we have to see how her jurisprudence develops, but I must tell you, even though she is very liberal. I like her a lot. I think she's got an independent mind. And um, she has, among other things, she was a public defender. And I think the court should have somebody like that who represents the viewpoint often of the poor and the indigent and uh, criminals. Uh, Justice Gorsuch um, is from the West. And again, you know, uh, Everybody brings something special, a, a, a unique perspective. Justice Gorsuch, who is a, a conservative and an originalist, um, has a very big heart for Native Americans. Uh, and it's quite surprising uh, that you will often see him writing an opinion in a case involving Native Americans that is extremely sympathetic to their point of view and that is joined largely by other liberal justices rather than conservatives. <clears throat> so, you know, this this idea, this categorization that you're liberal or conservative and that's straight down the line, is just kind of foolish. There's much more nuance there. Uh, and um, cons my conservative friends are uh, all over a spectrum from extreme libertarians to authoritarians. Um, and, you know, why should we simplify life or simplify judging um yeah there's a conservative majority but it's a pretty big tent that's kind of one of the interesting things about this court from my you know distant observation is that i think people tend to think oh it's five four five four five four all these decisions are five four five four you know uh, they're all over the place with the decisions that came out last year this year you know all these strange bedfellows that start to align with you know, uh, like you said, Gorsuch and Jackson being on the same side against uh, Kavanaugh. And, and it's really interesting once you get into the law and how legal affairs break down, it's a lot 
more gray, which is, I guess, why they're there. I do want to, before we end, ask you about uh, Justice Thomas and Justice Alito and yes. the appearance of impropriety that has popped up ProPublica. I'd love to see who is funding these investigations. Well, we know, actually. Do we? The Daily Caller has identified the source of much of the funding. It's, I think it's called the Sandler Foundation. It's a left okay. liberal billionaires who have funded it. Uh, liberals would say it was dark money. Uh, they have funded ProPublica and also some of the uh, public interest groups that are making complaints to ProPublica. So, that's and I'm not, I'm not saying that it isn't a good thing for us to understand where these justices are getting free rides and, uh, you know, in billionaire Paul Singer, I believe it is, giving free rides to Justice Alito in a plane, and then Justice Alito ruling over court cases that involve his companies that his hedge funds owns. Uh, you know, which Alito has come out and said, look, how am I supposed to know that? Uh, what do you make of the accusations against Justice Thomas and Justice Alito? Um, well, look, I completely agree with you that um, a free press, a vigilant press and media should be examining the ethics of Supreme Court justices, uh, as well as that of the White House, as well as that of Congress, as well as that of Nancy Pelosi, who probably remarkably, it seems to me, objected on grounds of ethics to Justice Thomas. I mean, consider well, the insider trades away. <laughs> uh, or uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who is, or Senator uh, Blumenthal in Connecticut. They are sponsoring legislation to codify ethics for the Supreme Court. I mean, in general, that's what a, pre, a free press is for in a democracy. So I don't fault what the, is happening on those grounds. I do think, I will tell you this, if Congress <coughs> attempts to codify ethical rules for the Supreme Court justices and attach sanctions to them, that itself, in my opinion, would be unconstitutional. There is a remedy for misconduct by Supreme Court justices, that is to impeach them. And if the House wants to impeach Justice Thomas or Justice Alito, and start drilling into their um, lifestyles, it can do that, and the Senate can remove them from office. But short of that, I do not think that Congress gets to regulate the Supreme Court, maybe the lower courts, but not the Could Supreme Court. Could you envision a court case where the Supreme Court rules on whether that law is constitutional and strikes yes. it down? Yes, I can envisage it. I mean, the Supreme Court, they find it embarrassing, obviously, but, for example, they had to rule on whether the federal income tax applies to themselves uh, because the Constitution provides that the salaries of justices and judges shall not be diminished, and the income tax clearly diminishes your salary, and they had to rule on that. In the end, they held, in the end, they held it did apply to them, and Congress could legislate an income tax and impose it on the justices. You know, as for Thomas and Alito, uh, and also, it's not just them. Gorsuch has been faulted, and um, um, Justice Barrett, too. She sold her house, would you believe? Think how scandalous that is. She sold her house, and she sold it to someone who was just appointed to the law faculty at Notre Dame. Even worse. <laughs> and worse of all, he runs a clinic, a legal clinic for the uh, students there. And they file amicus briefs in the Supreme Court. And to benefit his students, they even invited Justice Alito to an event in Rome. Can you imagine anything so <laughs> scandalous as that? So, I mean, with Justice Thomas and Justice Alito, uh, I would ask a question that um, a liberal law professor at Yale recently asked. Show me the rules that they violated. Show me the rules. There is now a rule requiring disclosure of gifts of travel. That's been clarified in recent months. But uh, in 2014, when uh, Alito, or 2008, I think it was, uh, when Alito was faulted, for, uh, he was faulted for not making disclosure uh, in those years, uh, it was not the prevalent understanding that gifts of travel were mandatory disclosure items. So I think if you look in the, the weeds, there's not a whole lot there. All right. Robert De La Hunty, 
uh, excuse me if I said your name wrong, Della Hunty, uh, is yep. the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Supreme Court. I'm mm-hmm. greatly enjoying it. I know that you will enjoy it. You can get a link in the show notes. You can also find it on Amazon. And, it's out uh, today. today out today. Yes. All right. Very yeah. good. Timely yeah. interview from me for yes, once. Indeed. Uh, shameless self-promotion time. Other than the book, where can people follow you? Do you have a website? Do you tweet? I don't. You know? No, okay. no, no. I'm a retired guy. And occasionally I write op-eds, often with John Yu. Yeah. Uh, I know him from the Hoover Institution and some yeah. of his work with Richard Epstein. So, uh, yes. yeah, highly recommend the book. It's uh, very thoughtful and informative. And thank you for writing it. And uh, thank you for uh, coming on the program. It's been great to talk to you. Likewise. Thanks very much. And thank you for listening here on The Chris Spangle Show. We will see you again soon.